Good morning, ShmooCon. Welcome. Uh, good morning. There you go. A little bit of, little bit of feedback. <laughs> Uh, so first, to kick things off here, uh, we're going to have a great um, discussion on um, hacker policy, um, some interesting things that have come around uh, this year, into this year. Uh, and so we have a panel here. Uh, moderator is going to be Jen Ellis, and they'll be joined by uh, Nick, Leonard, and Kurt. So if you put your hands together, give them a round of applause to kick things off. Uh, thank you for that, and thank you for having us. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Jen Ellis. I'm the VP of Community and Public Affairs at Rapid7. Uh, which means that I spend a lot of time harassing people in Congress, uh, trying to ensure that the things that they're talking about from a public policy point of view uh, end up being helpful, not harmful, um, and trying to encourage them to, to go in the right direction. I'm going to ask my delightful panel to introduce themselves, because they'll do a better job of it than I would. Uh, so, Kurt, we'll start with you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming out this, uh, this morning. Uh, my name is Kurt Opsahl. I am the General Counsel and Deputy Executive Director at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. We are a, uh, uh, some of you have heard of us already. Thank you. Uh, for those who haven't, uh, EFF is a nonprofit organization dedicated to defending your rights online. Uh, so we try and uh, push for things like privacy and freedom of expression, innovation, uh, trying to make a better digital future. Uh, and one of the things I do in particular uh, is work on our coders rights project. So I work a lot with security researchers who have uh, questions about the legalities and uh, legal issues that might arise from their research and from uh, coming to conferences like this one and disclosing that research. Good morning. Uh, my name is Nick Leiserson. I'm the legislative director for Congressman Jim Landrevin of Rhode Island. He's a member of the House Armed Services and Homeland Security Committees, and he's also the co-founder and co-chair of the Congressional Cybersecurity Caucus. I've been working for him for almost a decade. He is one of the few members, I would say, that is very focused on cybersecurity policy and is interested enough to both say, Nick, go talk at conferences like ShmooCon. This is my third con, so thanks for having me. And also uh, <laughs> to actually go out to Vegas. He was at DEF CON this year and also in 2017. Um, so he is very interested in hearing the perspective of security researchers and helping that have that inform his work in Congress. And uh, he's also interested in having people like me go out and try and explain at least to some extent how Congress is looking at the problem. Um, the, the one caveat I will say is I'm surrounded by lawyers. I'm not a lawyer. And uh, also, although I try and channel my boss as much as I can, what I'm saying today is with my Nick hat on, not as my, you know, avatar for Congressman Langevin. Um, I'm also not a lawyer, but just before Leonard introduces himself, I, I am expecting any minute now for DOJ to give me a honorary law degree. It's <laughs> totally how it works. Good Hi, morning. Leonard. How are you? Um, uh, <laughs> Leonard Bailey. I am a longtime listener, first-time Shmukhan panelist. Uh, I am head of the cybersecurity unit in the computer crime and intellectual property section and special counsel for national security in the same section. Uh, I've been with the department for 28 years, uh, worked in a variety of capacities, including special counsel to the inspector general, um, special counsel to the uh, assistant attorney general for national security, and um, uh, associate deputy attorney general responsible for cyber policy for the department. Um, we have worked for now about six years with Jen and members of the community on issues specifically related to computer security research, and I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you very much. And I will say just to add to their intros momentarily um, that, uh, firstly, Kurt, I think a lot of people here know the work of the EFF, and they know Kurt uh, specifically. Um, he, the work that he does um, in defending and protecting the rights of security researchers is incredible. And Thanks. he honestly taught me most things I know. So if I get things wrong, blame him. It's me. <laughs> um, but he, is, he has been a huge champion for this community for a very long time. And I also just want to you know, note as well, as Nick said, this is his third time speaking here. He's been to multiple security conferences. His boss has come out to Vegas. You know, that's unusual for a staffer. However, there are other staffers around. So if you're interested in talking to staffers, there are a few who are lobby conning. You know, go and talk to them, chat with them, ask them about their day. They're happy to answer questions. And I would also check out Hackers on the Hill next year if it's something you're interested in, which is an event that's tied to ShmooCon that basically tries to give members of this community an opportunity to understand what it's like to engage on policy and how to get involved. 
Um, and then I will just uh, add, you know, Leonard, I, I think that the Department of Justice is at best at times a bit of a scary entity for researchers, um, something that we maybe don't know how to navigate, we don't know what to make of. It's easy to assume um, a lack of good intent and uh, the computer crime and intellectual property section which Leonard is part of um, have actually done incredible work over the past six years to really build inroads into the community. Leonard has spoken at numerous security conferences to help people understand how the department thinks about security research. And, you know, even in the last couple of years, the department has come out with public comments supporting security research. They supported the renewal of the exemption for security research in the DMCA. And a lot of that is due to the work that Leonard and his colleagues do at the Department of Justice. So I just wanted to add my own flavor to say, like, we have some of the good ones here. Um, okay, so with that, we will get started. Um, so, you know, the reason we're here is to talk about what's happening in cybersecurity policy. Um, as we mentioned in our session description, there were 96 bills introduced last year that had the word cybersecurity in their title, which is an astonishingly high number. Um, it's not an unusually high number. It has been pretty high for the past several years. Um, this is an issue that Congress is active on and is talking about, even though it may seem to us in the community as if they don't necessarily spend a lot of time on it. Nick, can you sort of start us off by explaining why does Congress care about cybersecurity and what are some of the things that they've, they've been doing on this topic? Sure, so uh, Congress cares about cybersecurity because the internet is really important. <laughs> and even Congress can tell that, so it's important to our economy, it's important to our national security and our homeland security. Uh, if the internet is not functioning well, then uh, the United States is not having a good day. So that fundamentally is why Congress cares. Why does Congress care more now about it in the last couple of years? My boss likes to say he'd love that if it was through the educational work of the Cybersecurity Caucus, but it's probably due to the headlines that you'll read in the Times or the Wall Street Journal or from some of the great reporters that I see sitting around the room. Um, that has really, or Medza for Joe, okay. Um, so uh, that's one of the things that has really driven interest is the fact that people are becoming a lot more aware. Awareness of this is something that is a challenge that we're facing as a nation um, has really shot up in the past decade. And uh, when Congress members are aware of a challenge, they want to do something to fix it. Um, I'm not going to say that a lot or even all, all or even a lot of the 96 bills are great ideas on how to fix it, but there is engagement and, and that is very important and that is a change. That is not where we were 10 years ago when my boss was being looked at by his colleagues. You know, they were like, here's the tinfoil hat, Jim. This is not an issue that Congress should be really interested in. It's an IT thing. You know, it's all technical. There's no policy angle here. Um, despite the fact that there is 96 and not a lot of them are necessarily moving right now. It doesn't mean that Congress isn't getting stuff done. So uh, it's February 1st now, so not quite last month, but in December we did a couple of major things that I just wanna highlight in terms of Congress is moving on this issue. So first and foremost, um, we got, got another $425 million for election securities to the states. So that's in our appropriations bill. That's a pretty bill, cool thing. Right? And, and I mean, there is an awesome conference going on down the street right now, uh, the National Association of Secretaries of State and uh, election directors. And they are bringing in folks from this community, um, folks that are talking later tonight, come to their talk this afternoon, um, partly because Congress has said, we recognize this is a problem and here's some money to do some, something about it. Because the states, without that infusion of capital are not likely to have been as welcoming and to have had the bandwidth to say, no, we want to hear from this community. Uh, so we catalyzed that a couple years ago with an infusion of money and we put $425 million on the table for the 2020 elections. Probably not enough, but it is, you know, almost half a billion dollars is a significant chunk of change. Um, two other things that we did last month, one is one of the areas that Congress is very interested in is critical infrastructure security. So we passed as part of the uh, defense authorization a grid security act that basically is catalyzing um, research into operational technology, but primarily around the, the grid, just straight up security research to help folks understand better what the risk posture is with critical infrastructure and when industrial control systems are 
touching networks. Um, and then a last piece that I'll point out that we also did in the defense authorization is that uh, we've been trying to reform the way that the Department of Defense buys software because it's not very smart. Um, and it's very outdated, but in the reforms, we're also now requiring specific development security metrics that will be reported both throughout the department and to Congress so that we can try and bake more security in up front. And, you know, that seems it's a relatively minor provision. It's like, you know, a paragraph and a half long. But that's a kind of thing that can drive real change from the congressional side when you have people being held accountable for the security of their code going forward. And we're putting this, baking this into the acquisitions process from the beginning. So that's just what happened in December. Um, that's not going to be every month that <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Congress is, yeah, right. Uh, maybe one day, but not, not yet. But uh, I think there can be this feeling that, oh, there's this big, massive area of interest, but we're not getting anything done. And um, I wanted to kind of start out by dispelling the inter that, that idea. It's like Congress is getting stuff done. And one of the things my boss wants to do is make sure that what we're getting done reflects at least the input of the people that are in this room. Which means that you have to provide input if you have opinions and strong views on this. So, you know, feel free to get involved. We will talk a little bit about how you can get involved uh, later on in the panel. Uh, also, for anyone who's interested in election security, there is a session on election security at 5 p.m. in this room. Um, okay, so it sounds like a lot happened in December, and you said that not every month is going to be like that. Why not? Um, so, Kurt, do we expect that 2020 is going to be like, you know, a, a killer year and we're going to see a lot more good stuff happen? I mean, I, I, we have to keep in mind, Congress has a lot of things going on. What? One of which is, <laughs> I know, right? Uh, they've been very busy with some uh, uh, unusual things. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it's also an election year. Uh, and so that, that also, you know, t takes people out, out of the office. Uh, uh, you know, one of the things that helped to get uh, things that Nick just talked about passed where they were attached to some spending bills, which are must-pass bills, unless we have, or we have a shutdown, which sometimes also occurs. Uh, and so if you can attach something to a must-pass bill, like, has a good chance of moving forward. And so I think that was a helpful thing for making things happen in December. And I believe the next time that's going to come up is September. Uh, so there may be some things that are must-pass bills in, in September, and of course, in the meantime, things can move forward, but there's 96 bills. A lot of them will not be moving forward, or their ideas may be incorporated in something else. I mean, a lot of the bills come out as, as placeholders. Um, but I think, you know, uh, in an election year with, with many other uh, priorities happening, cybersecurity, I'm not saying, I think you're right that, that uh, cybersecurity is something that Congress considers to be important, but there's also a lot of other things going on and that also are important, and a, during an election year that keeps uh, uh, representatives uh, out of the office for, for an unusual uh, amount of time. A presidential election year also creates a lot of focus on the presidential election. So I'm not saying, I don't think this is going to be a banner year in, in cybersecurity, but we might see some things. And I will also add that the year after an election, also not a great year for stuff moving. Lots of confirmation hearings. We'll see what happens. Okay, so what might happen this year? What might actually move? What might we see uh, focus on Leonard and Nick? Well, one thing I'd, I'd mention is uh, something's a product actually of legislation from last year. The, um, National Defense Authorization Act of 2019 had a provision that stood up something called the Cyber Solarium Commission. How, how many people show of hands? How many people have heard of the Cyber Solarium Commission? Okay, okay some, some, but not many. So Nick's going to get into further detail on it, but just laying it out very, very briefly. Um, it's sort of an unusual um, commission. First, it exists, it, it's bicameral, so it has members of both the House and the Senate. Um, but it also has members of both the executive branch and the legislative branch, uh, which uh, makes it different than some of the prior efforts to kind of spin out higher level cyber strategy thought. Um, it, it's reminiscent of something that happened back in 1953, which was the Solarium, uh, Project Solarium that Eisenhower, President Eisenhower stood up uh, as a way of thinking about how to push back strategically against post-World War II uh, Soviet expansion. Um, the intent here is to um, think of big thoughts. Oh. Mic down. Yeah. Are you back on? Thanks. About um, how to uh, 
make some impact in uh, the area of cybersecurity, which is a very complex uh, and, and very uh, difficult issue. I mean, the one thing I'd pile on top of uh, what Kurt said was I think one reason that you're apt to see legislation that is in bite-sized chunks as opposed to some um, you know, big, big effort, and we'll, we'll get into this a bit later, is I, I think one thing that we have learned over time, a little bit of humility in this area, is uh, one, as was said earlier, cybersecurity is hard, um, and anyone who doesn't you know, recognize that or tell you it's so is either naive, misinformed, or trying to sell you something. Um, and so trying to really appreciate exactly how you disaggregate the issue, um, build a, a creature that has multiple moving parts that moves the issue of cybersecurity forward is, is not simple. Um, and I, I think we'll get into further details about that, but let me hand it to Nick for Cyber Solarium. Yeah, so my boss is one of the four members on the Solarium uh, Commission, and our report is expected to come out in mid-March, and uh, one of the, it, it, is, it is an unusual design, as Leonard mentioned, and part of the thinking is um, we, this, this can't be solved just by one branch of government, and it can't just be solved by government, and I mean, solved is not the right word anyways, but uh, the approach, the strategic approach you need, needs to be more than just the executive branch, more than just the legislative branch. It also needs to incorporate the private sector. So we have folks from all those different uh, areas at the table. And we are trying to leverage the fact that there are four members of Congress who are sitting on the panel to have some legislative recommendations that we will hopefully, I mean, I look at it as an, an infusion of policy ideas into the process. So you're going to see a lot of legislative recommendations that come out. I don't necessarily think that we're going to, like, get all on them in a presidential election year and get them passed out of the House before, uh, before the year end. But it will hopefully reinvigorate, you know, be a, be a fresh infusion of policy ideas. And as those ideas are being debated in Congress, again, that's where feedback is going to be incredibly useful. Um, one specific idea that we can, I'll speak to quickly that w was actually marked up out of the Homeland Security Committee earlier this week is uh, something you may read about or hear about is the, uh, an administrative subpoena provision, um, which sounds scary and I hope that it will not be. <laughs> uh, the idea being that right now, particularly with industrial control systems, if DHS see something, you know, they go on Shodan and they're like, hey, that looks like a dam. Um, unless there's malicious activity that's emanating from that IP address, they cannot find out who the owner is. They can try and go to the ISPs and they generally have had very little luck with ISPs saying, yes, we'll give you your subs the subscriber information. Well, that's illegal. But they've had little luck with the ISPs actually notifying the system owners and operators. So we're trying to close that loophole and say, hey, if they're just, just because they, if you see something vulnerable, you want to be able to tell someone, especially if they're operating critical infrastructure, and not wait until that system is beaconing out to something malicious before we can do that. So that's an example of something that is, again, and Leonard pointed out, that's a very bite-sized chunk, but it is something that I think, you know, you might see action on this year. And to add something on that administrative subpoena provision, um, I, it's something that actually will impact this community. Uh, as I understand it, we worked a bit with DHS on, on this proposal. Uh, you know, part of the thinking of it, uh, behind it was that it's not infrequent that either they would do a showdown search or, or something of that sort, or that computer security researchers would come to them with the results of research or a showdown search, um, and they were unable to leverage that information into uh, contact with a vulnerable system owner um, to, to help fix it. Um, the other thing I'd just I'd, I'd add is uh, there are attempts to wrap into it various protections, like there are, there is a time span by which once they get the information, they must reach out and contact um, the entity that, that had the vulnerable um, system. Uh, and also, if there is information that they somehow obtain that is unrelated to their mandatory destruction provisions that require them to purge that information. Um, and so there, there's, there's some attempt to balance uh, the ability to obtain this new information, this new authority, with some of the privacy concerns that typically pop up. So, okay, so, <clears throat> Um, so Congress has an appetite to do stuff. Things are kind of happening. It 
all kind of sounds a little governmenty in flavor. <laughs> you know, governmenty. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's like a lot of what the government can do or what the government does and should do. Why is none of this sort of tackling broader, the broader security ecosystem or broader security issues? I'll take that, Jen. Um, so <laughs> I think you should. <laughs> um, so I, I, one, I, I'm not sure it's, it's exactly accurate to say that it's not tackling some of, of those issues. But I would say that I think one thing that has happened over the years is, uh, with no, no insult to, to Nick, I mean, the pace of legislation has not been, let's say, fleet. Um, and there, 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 Seriously, there are, you actually can't hold Nick responsible. <laughs> <laughs> I know. There are lots of reasons for that. Um, I, and I, I think part of it is uh, lessons that we learned back in something like 20, 2012. Um, so just a big a bit of background. Back around 20, 2007, 2008, I'd say the federal government really started to focus on cybersecurity. Um, there was something called the Comprehensive National Cybersecurity Initiative that started in 2007, uh, end of the Bush administration, that rolled into the Obama administration. Um, and if you look at what came out of the CNCI, a lot of it was very specifically government focused. Um, okay. There are 12 initiatives and uh, you know, basically all of them focused on what the government would do. And there was a sense that the government was going to save the nation uh, with its abilities through the cybersecurity, uh, the CNCI. That apparently isn't the way it ended up. Uh, and uh, I think there was an appreciation that that was more complicated over time. And what you saw was a pivot in you know, around 2010 or so uh, through 2012 um, towards how there'd be better collaboration with the private sector. And so information's like, uh, I mean, issues like information sharing kind of popped up and came to the fore. But that was driven in part because there was a, a huge omnibus bill uh, in 2012, the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act of 2012, that uh, had a variety of, of things in it. Uh, workforce development, um, sort of international strategy, uh, uh, light touch voluntary uh, kind of regulatory scheme, um, information sharing as well. And that failed on the floor of uh, the Senate in August of 2012 um, on a party line vote. But uh, I think one of the lessons that, that came from that was big is just too hard. Um, I think they also saw some difficulties in uh, in trying to administer something that was that large because there's so many committees that have some jurisdiction over the matter, so getting that done is is, is not simple. Uh, we, we did ultimately get information sharing because the notion was pairing that back um, to something as simple and probably as uncontroversial theoretically as safety belts uh, was something of a, of a thought. Um, but, you know, I think there's some criticism of the, the legislation that re resulted at CISA. Um, it, has some liabilities. I mean, it has some sh some some shortcomings that we'll have to revisit in probably five years because it sunsets in five years. Um, so anyway, I, I, I say all that to, to say that there's a lot that's happening outside, though, of the legislative area that are sort of policy-driven efforts that are not about passing legislation but are about affecting change in the way that the government acts and the way in which the government interacts with the private sector. Um, and my office is doing some of that, that type of work. Uh, again, I'm the head of the cyber cybersecurity unit, and one of the things we've done a lot of is try to get guidance out to companies, private actors, security researchers, to enable them to do what they do better um, lawfully uh, and ideally perhaps more aggressively up you know, to legal limits. Uh, and so we, we're doing things like this, trying to make sure that we are actually leveraging capabilities and smart people like you to do things in cybersecurity better uh, without passing laws, but by doing things like providing interpretive guidance that will help people who are, let's say, wary of, of what they can and can't do because they're concerned about transgressing some sort of legal limit. Okay, that makes some sense. Um, and it brings us neatly, conveniently, to talking about the DMCA, uh, which I mentioned earlier. How, uh, show of hands, how many people have heard of the DMCA? If you're doing security research, let's hope you've heard of it. Um, okay, so I think this year we're going into the, the exemption process again. So Kurt, can you explain to us what it that, what that means? So, it begins. Uh, <laughs> I guess we can get the mic. 
Yes, the DMCA Digital Millennium Copyright Act passed in 1998, uh, and it uh, has a number of, of provisions dealing with, with uh, copyrights in the digital millennium, uh, and a lot of it, well, troublesome from our, our point of view. Uh, in particular, there were some provisions about digital rights management, or DRM, where the copyright industry was getting tired of uh, uh, making DRM and then having it broken like the day that it gets released. Uh, and they felt they uh, couldn't really be winning this by having better DRM, so they went to, uh, to Congress and got provisions that said it was unlawful to uh, break the DRM. Uh, and many people at the time were like, hey, but like there'll be some unintended consequences to that. Sometimes it actually is uh, you know, uh, uh, within the bounds of copyright law to uh, do something, you know, make a fair use of something, for example, uh, that DRM might prevent. Uh, and so, you know, this, this is too broad. It gives uh, too much of a restriction on uh, uh, things you might do with the computers involving copyrighted material. And so I said, okay, well, we're not gonna solve this today. Instead, we're gonna have a process. And that process is that every three years, the uh, Librarian of Congress organizes uh, to uh, uh, examine when there should be exemptions from the DMCA's anti-circumvention provisions. Uh, and we've been doing this every three years since uh, 1998. Um, and in the beginning, this was, this was a, a, uh, uh, you know, a very challenging process because every three years you had to reapply for the exemptions that, that you had the previous three years and if you wanted to expand it, like add, add some to that. Uh, and it made it a bit of an onerous process. There has been this one very important improvement is that uh, they streamlined the process for renewing uh, exemptions, thus freeing up more room to consider whether to expand the, the number of exemptions. Um, and so the last time uh, we, we had uh, exemptions, they came out in 2018. Uh, and so 2021 will be, uh, will be three years. Uh, and so, and how does that process begin? Well, uh, it's gonna start this year. Uh, in the fall sometime, people will submit requests for renewals, petitions uh, for either new or expanded uh, exemptions. Then by October, November, the Copyright Office, uh, which is part of the Library of Congress, will issue a notice of what classes it's considering in a briefing timeline. We'll do this briefing over the next uh, couple of months. Uh, and then if all goes according to schedule, uh, I mean, sometime in March or April of next year, we will have a new set of uh, uh, exemptions. Hopefully, many of, there's about a dozen exemptions right now. Uh, and so hopefully the ones that are there will either be improved or at least be, be kept as it, as it is. Um, the, one of the exemptions that uh, I think uh, matters to this community is a good faith security research exemption. Um, you know, I might wish that some things about that were a little broader, but I think it's a good, uh, a good start. It helps for uh, a lot of security research. Uh, there's also some exemptions for things like uh, doing uh, uh, work with vehicles that can enable security research on vehicles, which I think is gonna get more and more important as your cars get cyber. Uh, and uh, I think there may be some chances to, to expand upon these or add some, uh, add some new ones. Uh, and it's very important because uh, you know, we re represent a lot of security researchers who have done this and so many things are copyrighted that you, could, you should think about the DMCA under a lot of circumstances, whether there is a copyright protection that you're gonna need to get around in order to do some, like you know, if you wanna reverse uh, something, you might have to break some copyright protection in order to do that, to find out how it takes, to find out what the problems are. And even if your purpose behind this is you know, not trying to compete with the uh, uh, copyright holder, you're not, you're not trying to like, watch uh, movies for free, you're trying to do security research, but the way that the, the law is written, it is, is broad enough to, um, to make that uh, a legal challenge. And unfortunately, uh, several times we've had circumstances in which someone has done some research, but because of DMCA anti-circumvention provisions, uh, it created some awkwardness with coming out and presenting that research. Uh, and on that, on the DMCA uh, 
and the triennial process. Uh, that's sort of an area where we did not ultimately get um, active. In, two, in 2016, when this first, when our first exposure to it kind of came up um, as a cybersecurity unit, we weren't really positioned to say anything. Uh, when it came up in 2018, um, we in fact did uh, weigh in, and we actually weighed in in support of the computer security research exception. Um, we thought there were a couple of things there that were yeah, probably- Yeah, legit, it was a really big deal, and uh, it actually does deserve right. a round of applause. <laughs> there were a couple of things there, yeah. Well, great. I'll it was like actually home. kind of right. like a water a watershed moment. Is that yeah. a thing? I, mean, yeah. I normally say um, water mark. Is that a common moment, moment when we find ourselves on the same side of something? Right. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. But, but I think it's important in this regard. I think most people, when they think about this area, they, they focus on the CFAA, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, the federal hacking statute. And what they miss is exactly what Kurt was saying, that the DMCA, I think, is coming more and more into play where you're dealing with things like IoT devices or car hacking. Um, and so these exceptions are actually becoming quite important and you know, consistent with the thing we talked about. This is something that's happening outside of the ambit of legislative activity. Uh, this is this you know, process that spins up every three years whereby the library of Congress <laughs> uh, you know, gets these excep exceptions um, uh, proposed and then they can be instituted consistent with the statute as an actual, you know, essentially statutory protection um, just through this process. Uh, and so we're going to be engaged in this one and we're going to, again, have conversations about what we think uh, needs to be expanded or what does and doesn't work. Last time there were things like a requirement that research happen in a controlled environment, uh, which isn't always consistent with the sort of research that's done or limitations on certain types of devices, which we also thought were not necessary. Um, so we'll see what the proposals this time are. So, I mean, it's, it's crazy that we have to go through this process every three years uh, for something that really has nothing to do with copyright, right? So um, why, why can't, why, I'm looking at you, Nick, why can't Congress make this permanent? Why can't they make this a permanent exemption? Shouldn't that happen, Nick? Uh, yeah, would, Nick. I think it Shouldn't would that great. happen? Um, I think this goes back to something that uh, Kurt mentioned at the outset, which is Congress deals with a lot of things. And one of the things about reopening statutes um, like the, the CFAA or the DMCA is that once you go back and start saying, oh, well, we've made some mistakes here, we want to tinker around the edges, there are a lot of people in different communities that say, oh, yeah, we've got a problem with that as well. Um, and we would like to, you know, if you're, if you're going to go and reopen that particular piece of legislation, let's also add this on and this on. So trying to find a coalition either that is willing to say, we're going to stay laser focused and fix just this one piece, um, even though we know that the bill is going to come to the floor and it's going to say reopening the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, um, or else trying to band together a broad coalition to do comprehensive reform is not necessarily easy. Both of those require a lot of political will. Just to quick show of hands, who out. wants to form a coalition with me to get this as a narrow thing that gets passed? Okay, we've got a coalition. Great. <laughs> Come to the Hill. Tell, call your member of Congress and say, this is a problem. And I'm not kidding about that. Like, absolutely. <laughs> you know, if it, it is one thing to say, yes, I'm interested in fixing this. It's another thing to put pen to paper or send your congressman an email, or best of all, just pick up the phone and call your member of Congress and say, I live in your district, this is important to me, it's important for the country, and we gotta fix it. Um, because, you know, raising your hand is great, and I'm gonna take that back to my boss and say, yeah, you know, there is a, a community that wants to see this fixed, but him telling his fellow members of Congress that this is important, we should fix it. They're like, uh-huh, sure, Jim. You know, them hearing directly from their voters, the people that they are accountable to, that they have to go back and reapply for their jobs every two years, that is gonna make a difference. And can you, can I just add a yeah, couple Yeah, but I, just, I also wanna make sure that when Nick does talk to his boss and says that, that he tells them that the DOJ is supportive of it, because that's what I heard. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I have to say that in terms of making the, the current uh, exemptions under the DMCA triennial process permanent. Uh, I mean, I, I can't say we don't have a definitive position on it, but given what we have previously said, which were entirely consistent with the except exceptions that exist right now, I'm guessing there wouldn't be a lot of pushback from the department. Hooray, you had it so. first. Yes. 
just a, a couple of quick notes. One is uh, it's really important to get your, your voices heard on, on these kinds of issues. Uh, the entertainment industry really likes the, the DMCA anti-circumvisions and they have uh, you know, a big voice uh, on, the, on the Hill. Uh, and so to you know, counteract that, it's good to have uh, the uh, representatives hear from this community and not just be hearing from the entertainment industry. And you might think, well, what do they care about security research? But I, at least I've found that uh, like any, any chink in the armor of the DMCA anti intervention is something that they are suspicious of, and so it's good to get other voices out there. Uh, and then one other quick note, uh, on the DMCA, we're also trying a, a different path to try and deal with the anti circumvention provision. We have a lawsuit uh, challenging the constitutionality of the DMCA. We're representing uh, Matt Green and Bunny Huang. Uh, and uh, so I won't go into great detail about that, but uh, if, that, if that succeeds, then that also will mean that you won't need the, uh, the exemptions. Thank you. So, um, so Leonard had mentioned the CFAA, and I think Nick mentioned it as well. Uh, show of hands, who's familiar with the CFAA? <laughs> right, absolutely. Good fun fact. Um, and uh, we would definitely tell that story if we were not low, low on time. Um, so, uh, this, the computer problem is like something that I've been uh, actively advocating for a security research carve out on for years. Um, when I say that, it makes me feel like a bit of a failure because it hasn't happened yet. Um, but I do think that we've seen a bit of a, a tide change in that time. Like, I think there's a tonal shift in how the government, uh, both in the executive branch and in Congress, seems to think about security research. Is that fair? Do you think that's, that's true? Yes. Um, first, I think that, you know, when it comes to the executive branch and how they think of it, you know, Thank this man. <laughs> I mean, genuinely, like, I think that's a real thing. Yeah, yes. I mean, this. Uh, I, I am not. I, I am not being glib. Like, one of the chief reasons that the executive branch is thinking of it differently is because of people like Leonard, and not like maybe drop the like is because of Leonard. Yeah. So um, I think it's very important for folks in this room to understand that because it's one thing for my boss to say I'm going to try and create the the policy environment where we can have progressive cybersecurity policy. And he tries his damnedest to do that. Um, but it's another thing for the people that are actually doing that work. And you know, if we're operating, we like to say at like low Earth orbit level, Leonard is writing the policies that are actually saying to the Department of Justice, this is how you should look at CFAA violations. And he is doing a fabulous job. So please bear that in mind. Um, in terms as, of how... Just as a quick aside, though, I just want you to know that both Nick and Leonard are people who are in actual physical pain when anyone gives them a compliment or gives them credit for something. So the irony of Nick doing that to Leonard is just beautiful. Um, more broadly, I mean, the... the I'll, I'll tell a quick story, right, which is um, hack the Pentagon and what's come out of that, right? I mean, when my boss first heard that, of all places, the Department of Defense, the Department of Defense was going to have a vulnerability disclosure policy, and in addition, run a bug bounty, but you know, just fundamentally say, no, we're changing our attitude and we want to hear from the community, he was floored. He also immediately went to the well of the house and was like, please come hack the Pentagon. We got four weeks. Let's do this. <laughs> um, so. That has translated, I mean, it has taken government time to get it done. That was in 2016, it's 2020. But in November of 2019, so two and a half months ago, the Office of Management and Budget, so the White House, and the Department of Homeland Security said, you know what, every government department and agency needs to have a vulnerability disclosure policy. And the guidance that DHS put out to say, what does it need to look like, is incredibly good. <laughs> it is very progressive. It is very attuned to the interests of the folks in this room. And like, if you had told me three years ago that that was gonna be a possibility, I would've said, well, maybe because of what DOD did. Five years ago, I would've said, forget it. No, that's not the way people look at it. And the people that are weighing, the people that are weighing in you know, the, the members of Congress that are writing letters in and saying, what do they think of this new policy? 
are just effusive in their praise. And again, that's like not the same thing as writing the policy, but it is important to realize that it's like that is the attitude that is existing in both in DC and on the Hill specifically right now, and that is a big change. Awesome. So uh, I, I, I want to continue in this and ask Leonard if maybe he'll give us some insight into what's coming next. But I'd also like to ask the audience, if you've got any questions, start lining up and we'll, we'll try and get to some. Go ahead. What can you tell us, Leonard? Oh, I, I mean, just very quickly, I mean, one, I'd like to make sure that everyone understands that to the extent that I'm able to provide any help on, on policy, it, obviously, uh, that wouldn't happen if I didn't have the support of people in my office and in my management chain. And so I, I say that to say that this is a time of pretty intense tribalism. And I think we tend to assume that all positions are fixed. Um, uh, one would hope your government would be responsive to you. And so things like this are what we do to learn what is needed, what uh, would be helpful, and try to figure out what is possible in the confines of the law and our mission and balancing other interests that, that have to be balanced. Um, so kind of just, again, echoing the notion that uh, you know, letting us know what, what is helpful and what's necessary helps us make better policy. Okay, um, so I'm gonna ask you just down the line to just give like one thing like that would be your piece of advice to people in the audience who are interested in getting involved and helping to shape public policy other than obviously joining my coalition that I just <laughs> formed right here. <laughs> Uh, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Uh, one way to get involved uh, is uh, EFF has what we call our Action Center, uh, and you can go to our, our website, find the Action Center, and it will show you various opportunities, like you can write in to your representative about this bill, we'll explain what we think about the bill, encourage you to find it, help you identify the communication method that works with your uh, representative. Um, and this is a chance for you to put your, your voice out there. Sometimes as well, there are rulemakings, things like the DMCA, where it's helpful to get uh, people's points of view uh, or, or histories with that to show where problems are. This also comes up in FCC and FTC things, so there are opportunities to get your voices heard. Uh, and I encourage you to try and take those uh, opportunities and make sure when, when Congress is doing something or the executive is doing something, it at least knows where you're coming from and hopefully it gets to a better process as a result. Yeah, I, I mean, what Kurt said is pr pretty much sums it up. The two things are pay attention because the things that are happening in policy can affect your lives. And if you're not paying attention, then what's liable to happen might not be in your interest. And you might wake up one day and say, how the heck did that happen? Um, and to make your voice heard. And you know, I think that people greatly underestimate how responsive members of Congress are to their constituencies. And uh, you know, it's, it's great to come and talk to me. And I'm going to, you know, my boss is again saying, Nick, go out and learn. But for a lot of members, they're like, well, you know, why should I really care about this particular issue? And the way you make them care is you say, I'm a voter in your district, it matters to me. And um, that like cannot be overstated how important that is. And then the corollary to that is tell your friends, right? It's like one voice speaking up on something is important because most members don't think of this as a, this matters in my home kind of an issue. Um, a lot of voices speaking up on it, then you get a coalition, then you get political power and get stuff done. And just in the interest of time, I'm gonna make this very quick, I mean, what they said. And what, <laughs> uh, I mean, also, we, we do try to have be a presence at a lot of these sorts of events. Really, seriously, take the opportunity to come and talk to us. Yep. Yeah, and I will just um, add that we had to be selective on what we could cover because of the time limitations. There is a huge amount that Congress is looking at at the moment and the executive branch is looking at. IoT is a huge thing. Um, supply chain, privacy, and, and how security fits into that are very big topics that we didn't get to cover today. Um, I, would, I would say look at what's happening, and if you have an opinion on one of those topics, don't feel like you can't go and talk to the people who are working at the offices that are working on it just because you're not in their constituents. They are going to be interested in talking to you if you have expertise that you can add to them uh, to, to help them get a better outcome. Okay, so um, thank you, panelists. Uh, I think we might have time for one. Are we, can we do one question? Is that allowed? Two, two, All two, right. Two.
All right, thank I you. I have a huge question, so I'll just let you go ahead and I'll let the back. Well, you're all so nice to each other. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Brendan. So, <laughs> on solarium specifically, um, the Solarium Commission has said that they intend to have a set of legislative recommendations that they think they can get through Congress now, and another set that they intend to wait for, I believe their exact words were, a cyber 9-11 event uh, to wait for. Hooray! Following specifically on the model of USA Patriot, passed immediately in the aftermath of the other 9-11. Are you concerned at all about what Solarium's gonna say and their efficacy in having a, I believe, censured for bribery and corruption admiral drive that kind of an agenda through? Um, I think that, you know, the way that I would look at it is, so the way uh, my boss puts it is in order to get something through Congress, especially if it's a significant change, you need a problem, you need a solution, you need a window of opportunity. And uh, one of the things on the cybersecurity piece right now is that the window of opportunity tends not to be for comprehensive things, as Leonard mentioned earlier. So when we say in the Solarium context that there are gonna be things that we don't think that there's a political will to move on right now, it's because cybersecurity presents a lot of policy challenges and some of them uh, will, for instance, reforming the way that Congress itself looks at cybersecurity and saying, hey, there are 80 plus committees and subcommittees that have jurisdiction, that makes it difficult for us to be nimble and reflect the speed of, even close to the speed of technological innovation um, that's a hard change for Congress. That means that people in Congress are gonna have to say, no, I will give up some of my authority over something for you know, the greater good. And the way that that's gonna happen is you're gonna need a lot of political will. And I think that uh, one of the ideas behind Solarium recommendations that are more in the, we probably can't do this right now is to say, well, here's a group of members that are organized and we're gonna start trying to build that political coalition. But we do recognize that there are recommendations that we wanna put out that are an, a desired end state and kind of a path to get there, but we're also not so naive as to think that people are ready to make those choices right now. And um, I think that's important. I think if you just go for the low hanging fruit of what you think you can pass today and don't say, but these are still big problems that are out there, then you're missing part of what, what you could get done with your mandate. Can we do another one or are we done? We can do one, okay, this is the last one. Thank uh, you. One comment, um, after reviewing um, uh, reverse engineering a lot of products, once the DMC allowed us to see it, we found interesting bits of other people's code, including open source that was actually hidden in those that we had to bring up. So I'm fearing that the DMCA is not just providing intellectual property protection for their own stuff, but it's also hiding that open source code was used and it's violating the open source licensing as part of that particular process. And I've been, this has been going on for about 15 years. So I just wanna make that a, a, a point. The second thing is, so, would we support, uh, say, hack Congress and hack the uh, uh, Justice Department so we can actually, uh, the, the justice, the, the courts, so we can actually improve the security of those? Um, uh, just on that, quickly, I mean, there is, in fact, uh, work at DHS to require a vulnerability disclosure policy for all agencies, which I know is not the same as, for example, the affirmative hacking program. Um, I, I, I don't know. I'd have to talk to our CAO to see uh, how he, feels about that issue. I think we have models now that suggest that those things can be done, they can be done in a way that's secure and safe, so yes. who knows. Yes. And thank okay. you for those models, you and Katie. <laughs> um, I, so I just would like to really thank our panelists. They will be around today, or at least two of them will. I don't know if Leonard will. Yeah. Um, and, and, and very quickly, um, so uh, about seven years ago, um, I met Jen, and she started very, well, very aggressively working with the government. Um, we, are, we are losing Jen. Um, she is leaving to go back home, um, the land of Benny Hill, boiled entrees, and fleeing royals. Um, but I, I wanted to make sure we took this opportunity in front of this crowd um, to make the point that there's often a question of whether what you do matters. Um, I know I, 
have that question for myself every day. I, I want to say to Jen that uh, what she's done with the community, um, working, making sure that we did things like a vulnerability disclosure framework that was published by DOJ, um, the DMCA letter, those things wouldn't have happened without Jen. Um, and uh, we often have these battles uh, where she counsels me on the law. Uh, Jen's not a lawyer, but damn it isn't if she isn't often correct. So we, in fact, are presenting her with an honorary law degree. Um, so, uh, so um, to Jen, InfoSec Jen Ellis, uh, we are uh, awarding a Juris Friggin' Doctorate, the JFD degree, um, and all the rights that appertain. So thank you, Jen. Thank <laughs> you.